those that uh, are trying to uh, enforce the laws. When I go by a state trooper or sheriff's department or emergency vehicle or whatever, I pray for them as I'm going down the road. Ask God bless them. Give them a good day. If I see you, some of them in a restaurant and I go by, I tell them, you fellas be safe. I want you to know you're prayed for and people love you. Uh, you see the baser sword out here. So what we've got here is a great authority problem. So he said one, one of the heads of every tribe, 12 tribes. You say, well, which one of them is going to uh, be the boss? That's what they're going to find out. God already knew, Moses knew, Aaron knew, and they should have known. So when you look at them here, he said, you speak unto them that they take a rod. Look at verse 3. And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi. God established the Levitical priesthood. The Aaronic priesthood came through uh, Aaron, but the Levitical priesthood, instead of taking the firstborn of every family, you say, well, why didn't God just do it the old-fashioned way? If you take the firstborn of every family, you're taking strength of that family out. Families need the firstborn. This was back uh, years ago in the days of the patriarch. Uh, I thank the Lord for my oldest brother, Danny. I call him the patriarch of the family. Uh, anything that moves, I try to run past him. If there's something going on family-wise or otherwise, I try to keep him informed. Uh, of what's going on. You say, why? Because he's the firstborn. I believe we need to respect that, and that's what they were doing here. So he said, you take Aaron, because he's the head of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers, and thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony where I will meet with you. He said, what I want you to do in the morning, with everybody bring a rod, but you put the name of the tribe. The name of the individual that's heading that tribe, you put their names on them. In the morning, we're going to take them to God. Moses is showing them and that this is not me speaking. This is what God said to do. God's the one that's going to show you who the choice is. So he said, then I'll meet with you. Verse 5, and it shall come to pass that the man's rod, whom I shall choose, shall blossom and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the people of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. Again, they were taking this out on Moses and Aaron. They weren't taking this out on God. They weren't complaining at God. They blamed Moses and Aaron for everything that took place, and they were just simply following orders. So they said, hey, we're going we're gonna to make this murmuring cease. Verse number 6, And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece, for each prince won according to their father's houses, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among the rods. So now they've got all twelve, they brought them to the, to the tabernacle, they brought them to the outside of the tent. Uh, they didn't take these inside of the tent. They brought them to the tent itself. Reason being, nobody could go inside of the tent itself. And in the tent, you had the holy place. That was where you had the uh, candlestick. You had the table of showbread, altar of golden incense. Then you had the veil. And then, of course, you had the inside of the veil, the Ark of the Covenant. But nobody went in there but the descendants of the high priest, even Levites, never went inside that tent. Matter of fact, Levites never saw anything that was inside of that tent after it was made and placed there. Even when they moved this tabernacle, the sons of Aaron, that's the, the high priest, they went in and covered all of these articles before they ever took that tent down, lest anybody be looking on them and, and die. So we find here that uh, they're going to bring this thing before God. Verse number 7, And Moses laid the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds, bloom blossoms, and yielded almonds. They went in, all of these rods were exactly the same as the way they went in except for Aaron's. 
This rod is not a living thing, all right? When they take uh, these rods and they use them for years, and Aaron used his, no doubt, for years, uh, the old people used to have uh, rods that they walked with. They were just like a cane. Uh, my younger brother makes what he calls thumb sticks. And it's it literally a stick about this high, and then he takes a part of a deer antler. And he makes it to where you can put your thumb in that thing on the top, and you can hold it. They make good walking sticks. So these were not something that was alive, but God brought life out of death. God caused that rod that Aaron had used for no telling how long. He probably had one of them when he was still uh, in Egypt. Uh, but that was his personal rod, and it was representative of the house of Levi. So this thing put forth buds and blossoms and almonds, and Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod. They went through there, each one of them took them, they had their own names on them, and when they pulled them all the way, there was one of them left, and it was the one that budded. Verse 10, And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels. Notice what he calls the murmurs. Nothing but a bunch of rebels. What's rebel mean? It, it means to be rebellious. Uh, we live in days of rebels. Uh, there, there was an old saying years ago, rebel without a cause. Uh, people, they, just, they rebel against everything today. Uh, like I said, no obedience to authority, no obedience to parents, no obedience uh, to teachers at school, no obedience to the law, no obedience to anybody. They're just a bunch of rebels out here running around. So we find that he said, this is going to be as a token against the rebels those that rebel against the things of God. <coughs> and thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me. He said it's going to quieten that crowd down. But he made a statement there in verse number 10 that they die not. You say, what's the end of rebellion? Eventually it's a death of one type or the other. Uh, people that will not listen, a lot of times they die early. I learned a long time ago, you listen to advice, good advice, bad advice. You, you've got to learn to discern that over the years. Uh, but when somebody gives me a piece of advice, I don't just say, I don't want your advice. I'm boss around here. Uh, a lot of times they've got a whole lot easier way. I thank God for YouTube. You know what it is? YouTube is advice. I fix a whole lot of things. I go on YouTube, just type in a question. I've got one now, something I've got to fix, and I'm going to go in there and type a question in. How do you do this? And you know what? You bring up 10 videos that show you how to do this. I remember when a headlamp went out on my car. I've got a Chevy that work cars in 2012. And uh, Barbara said, you've got a headlight out. I said, I had no big deal. I just stopped down here at the old ozone down here and picked me up a $28 light bulb to go in it. I told her a 10-minute job. We'll have that thing going. I went home, popped the hood. I couldn't find any way to get into that light. It was solid steel down there. Couldn't get a hand in around it. You couldn't get into it anyway. I looked underneath. There wasn't any way to get to it underneath. I said, YouTube. I found a guy that said, I found out the easiest way to do it. He said, you put your car up on the rack, take the wheel off, you cut a hole up in, in the fender wheel on that front one, and he said, you can reach up there and you can almost get your hand to it to try. And I thought, are you crazy? It cost me $250 to get a headlamp changed. They had to take the whole front end of the car off of that thing, all right? Sometime YouTube tells me to take it to somebody else. But he said, I'm going to teach these rebels. They won't listen to anybody. They'll listen to me or they'll die. God kind of put an ultimatum here in verse number 10. He said that they die not. If this does not take away their murmurings, you know, they could have rebelled and said, well, I know his, his budded, but his was greener than ours, all right? They could have just put that on nat natural uh, phenomenon, but he just simply said, now, if they're not going to listen to this, 
they'll die. If they, if they listen to what I'm telling them, then they can live at that point in time. Verse 11, And Moses did as the Lord commanded, so did he. And the children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Hey, it put the fear of God in them. Now, they're not dying. They're talking. They're not perishing. We all perish. We perish. That, that's present tense. Not that we will one day perish, but we perish. We, we're dying. We perish. And then he said, we all perish. He said the whole crowd of us, and God was letting them live. But at least it put fear into them. Look at verse number 13. Whosoever cometh anything near unto the tabernacle of the Lord shall die, shall we be consumed with dying. So God satisfied them to that degree. They actually put the Aaron's rod that budded in the ark itself. Now, there were three things found inside of the Ark of the Covenant. They had the table of law. That was the second tables that God gave unto Moses. Then they had the pot of manna in there. And then they had Aaron's uh, rod that perished. Three different things. One of them just simply had to do with God's laws not going to change. And you need to keep that premier. And then that pot of manna that God will take care of you in the hardest times of your life. And then that Aaron's rod that budded that you can follow the leadership, leadership of God and you can do well. All right. So they, these were memorials. Chapter 18, the Lord said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. Now, he goes back to Aaron and he says that you and your children are going to bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. Nobody else could go in there. If things were not done right within that tent, then it fell upon the Aaronic priesthood at that point in time on the high priest. He told them, I'm going to put you in responsibility for that. You bring that down to the pastor. Pastor has a lot of responsibility with the church. Now, I believe the iniquity of the church needs to go upon the pastor. That's why uh, what's going on on this property, and a lot of people say, well, you're a dictator. I'm not a dictator. But anything I'm accountable for, I'm going to be responsible in the running of it. I had somebody one time wanted to bring a ministry onto the church. He said, I'll join the church if I can bring my ministry with me. And it wasn't a bad ministry, so I just told him. I, he met with me here at church. I told him, I said, well, that's fine. I'm going to let you run it, but you need, to, you need to understand when you bring it here and use our facilities, I'm going to be over it. And boy, he didn't like that. He said, I'll take it someplace else. I said, yes, sir, you will. I told him, if I'm going to give an account for it, then I'm going to take responsibility over the top of it. That's what he's telling them here. He said, you're going to bear the iniquity of the sanctuary, and thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. I believe there's heavy accountability to God's men. I, I don't take that lightly. I, I, I love the church. I want the church to do right. I want the church to be right. I believe that's the work of the pastor to oversee. He's an overseer. He looks out upon the church and make sure that things are done decently and in order. Anything that comes on this property is going to have to be done decently and in order. If it's not done that way, then it doesn't need to be on the property. It's just that, uh, But he's talking about the priesthood. He said, you're going to bear that iniquity. Look in verse number 3, And thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of thy father, bring thou with thee that they may be joined unto thee and minister unto thee. Now, again, you've got the difference of the uh, Levitical priesthood and the Aaronic priesthood. The Levitical priesthood was there to assist the high priesthood. That's what they were there for. You know, there's no way that Aaron and his sons, he had four sons, two of them died before the Lord. Now he's got two more sons. And there's no way that three men are going to be able to take care of all this work. When you take the work of the tabernacle, you just take the daily sacrifices. If people sinned, they had to bring a sacrifice. 
got three and a half million people out there, all right? Hey, I'm talking about, I believe the work of that, that uh, tabernacle was a busy work. I believe there was smoke and smell and everything going on all day long. It, it took a crowd to do it. So what we have here is people in the church. One, you've got a deacon board, and I thank God for my deacons. What are they for? They're, they're servants. They help. And I thank the Lord. been praying for Brother Bob's health uh, to get back on his feet again, get, get back up, get his strength back. I told God he's important not only to the church and his family, he's important to his pastor, him and Miss Janet, to get back on their feet again to where they can function and do what needs to be done. A pastor cannot do it all. He may have to do it all, but he's, he's not made to do it all. Eventually what will happen, if you're not careful, he'll break down. And then when he breaks down, then everything starts breaking down underneath him. That's, that's why I tell people, get involved in the work. I mean, you say, well, I'm not part of the Levitical priesthood. You're a child of God. Last time I looked, we were individual priests. Uh, we are part of that priesthood, and it, it takes everybody. And that's what he's telling Moses and them, One, or Aaron. He said, your father's house, hey, they're going to bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. They're going to be responsible. And thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. So what he said, thy brethren need to join in with you and minister. Look at verse number 2 again. And minister unto thee, and thou and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of witness. Now, he said, you and your sons will take care of the inside of the tent, but you don't mess with the outside. You don't offer sacrifices. You don't stoke the fires. You don't clean up the mess after it's all over with. He said, this is not your responsibility. I'm talking about the tabernacle. Hey, when we have a meal, I'm one of the first ones I like to pitch in. Here lately, I, I guess I got a little slothful. Look around, people cleaning up already, and I'm still sitting down eating my fourth round of whatever at, at the table instead of getting up and going to work. I like to pitch in there. I'm industrious that way. I'm organized. I found out a long time ago, if you got to move a mountain, don't look at the mountain. Just grab a shovel, put your head down, take a shovel full out, and before you turn around twice, the mountain will be gone. Uh, I'm the same way at home. Barbara says, you go sit down and do something in there that's productive, and I'll take care of the kitchen. I can wash and dry dishes quicker than she can clean stuff up and put it in the refrigerator. I just, that's the way I, I just, I'm hands, I'm a hands-on guy. I like uh, to do work. I don't mind doing that. But what he's doing, he's giving it a huge responsibility because the charge of that outside was not something they could handle. It was out of the realm of their handling, not out of the realm of their expertise. They could have done that. They were Levites. Every high priest was a Levite, but not every Levite was a high priest. They could have done that work. But if they handled what they had to do, you know, over in the New Testament, God said, look out among you seven men of good report, full of the Holy Ghost, and put them over uh, those things, they said that we might give ourselves to the Word of God and to prayer. So there's things that I need to handle, there's things that you need to handle. We can bring that all the way down. But at the same time, he's telling them, you take care of it right. Look in verse 4, and they shall be joined unto thee and keep the charge of the tabernacle of the congregation for all the service of the tabernacle, and a stranger shall not come nigh unto you. Now, these had to be Levites. They had a mixed multitude that came out of, of, of Egypt. They came out with a mixed multitude, a lot of strangers, a lot of people just f fled. Uh, you go over to Gaza today, you've got all types of people trying to get out on that southern border now and go through there. You've got Americans, you've got Arabs, you've got all types of people trying to get out of Gaza. If they've got any sense, they're going to get out. Because when they start clearing buildings and clearing stuff, they don't have time to check your ID and find out who you are. They told you to get out. Now, now they need to be getting out. So you've got all types of people 
uh, over there. He's talking about Levites. Nobody worked inside of that compound except for Levites. That was the tribe that did the work, not strangers. These were not uh, people non-Levi nor people that were not Jews. But he said in verse 5, And ye shall keep charge of the sanctuary and the charge of the altar, that there be no wrath any more upon the children of Israel. What happened in verse number 5 was God said, I don't want anything that took place in chapter 16 going on anymore. He said, we have established the hierarchy and who gets done what. And if, there, if they don't, there's going to be wrath. He said that there be no more wrath. So what he's done, he set up that tabernacle itself. He set up authority with a, with a budding rod. He set up the authority with the censors. He did all that for them. And then he set up the Levitical priesthood on the same side. Verse number 6 and I, behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. To you they are given as a gift for the Lord to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. That was verse number six. These that God chose are a gift. Something God gives. Boy, you go over to the New Testament, over to the book of Ephesians. He said he gave gifts. So when the Lord... Uh, brought forth captivity, uh, took captivity captive, and that's when he descended into Abraham's bosom. They were captive. Uh, the Bible even calls it prison over in the book of uh, 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 Peter. A lot of people get confused about that, that the Lord went and preached to those that were in prison, and he qualified who they were that, that were rebellious in the days when the ark was a preparing. These sons of God were of the messianic line. Mm -hmm. I don't believe everybody died in that flood, died lost. I think they died disobedient. God gave them opportunity. Hey, why would he give somebody an opportunity to get on the ark? That was, that's not salvation. They, they teach the ark as sal a uh, ark of salvation. You don't build your own salvation. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I believe a lot of those people who died in that flood were saved and disobedient. They were worldly. They had cross-married. And they didn't listen to the man of God when he preached the word of God to them, and they perished. I believe people still perish for this cause. Many are sick and uh, uh, weak, and uh, many, many perish already. Many die. They sleep. So we find in verse number 6, he said, I've given these people to you as a gift. Let's go back to the gift. And he gave some prophets and some apostles. You had Old Testament, they had the prophets, and New Testament, they had the apostles. He goes on down, he talks, and to the church today, the evangelist, and the pastor and teacher, all right? The evangelist, who is that? That's your biblical missionaries, flaming evangels that carry the word of God to places where it's not named and preach the word of God to a world. Uh, we've got people that go around and preach revivals at churches, and they, they are, I guess, an evangelist to the church or a missionary to the local churches. But at the same time, you've got your evangelist. The only other one that they gave was the pastor and teacher, which is the same individual. A pastor has to be apt to teach. He has to have the aptitude of teaching the Word of God. I heard a man one time say, I'm a preacher, not a teacher. I thought, then you have no business pastoring a church. If you're going to pastor a church, you've got to preach. If you're going to pastor a church, you've got to teach. You've got to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. You've got to be able to handle the scripture and feed that scripture to the people. These men are a gift to the church. A gift that has to be received. It can be received or it can be rejected. So he's letting Israel know to you they are given as a gift for the Lord to do the service of the tabernacle congregation. Now, that tells me that the Levites were a gift to Aaron. They were men that would help him to do the work and his children. Look at verse 7. Therefore thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priest offer for everything of the altar and within the veil. 
and ye shall serve. I have given your priest office unto you as a service of gift, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. I believe that it's a gift to a pastor uh, to be able to to stand where I stand. I, I don't I don't take this for granted this morning. And standing up here does not make me one iota better than you are. I still say the biggest enemy I ever face is the one I look in the mirror early in the morning. That is the enemy that I face. I'm not always proud of who and what he is. Sometimes I give bad advice, right, Miss Janet? Yeah, I give bad advice. Uh, man, that, anybody drink any of that hot chocolate last night? Man, there, were, there was a... There was a five-gallon, five-pound bag of sugar in there, so I came by and missed, I told Miss Jenna, hot chocolate. I said, it's sugar-free. I was joking with her. So she <laughs> drinks it all down. Her sugar went up 300 last night. I, I felt bad. When she came in, I was doing this. Thank you, Lord. I'm glad. Because she said, if I don't make it church, preacher, it's because of your bad advice, all right? Uh, but I thank the Lord for that. But anyway, these are service gifts. I do not take this up here for granted. I try to come to church prepared. I am excited about preaching this morning, and I'm excited about preaching tonight. I've got everything set right here, loaded and ready to go. And I think I have two of the best messages that I probably won't present right. But I've got two of the best messages that I'm ever going to preach that's going to be this morning and tonight. I'm talking about things that are, ought to be a blessing to the people of God. Uh, God's people ought to be th uh, uh, just thrilled about it, all right? Verse number 8, he said, I'll give you charge. Now, he's going to break this on down, so we're going to stop with verse number 7. But what he's done, he has reestablished. Reestablished. I use that word. He didn't establish leadership. When Moses led them out of, Is, uh, of Egypt, they followed leadership. He reestablished the same leadership. He didn't change the, uh, the guard, all right? He, he, it was just simply a changing of the guard with the same type of people. But he reestablished authority because if you don't have authority... You have no structure, and if you have no structure, you have confusion and chaos. And I found out a long time ago that God is not a God or a God of disorder. God is a God of absolute order. Everything in this world is ordered, and it's ordered right. Amen. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for the word of God this morning. Uh, Lord, just so many things that we could teach along these lines. and What a thrill it is to have the Word of God. But I pray you'd bless the service to come. Be with our people, Lord. We've still got some sickness going on. We've got people having testing, surgical procedures done, uh, a lot of things this week. And I just pray that God help them. But Lord, bless this day. Uh, Lord, we want to, at the end of the day, look back and, and say, Lord, it has been a good day to be in God's house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Go into the prayer rooms.
Hey, Britt. Hey, Britt. All right, let's have all the choir come on up this morning. <laughs> 